This is Mike from FearShop.com. Make sure you like this video and leave your comments. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell to set up notifications so you know when the next video drops. Let's get into it. In the summer of 1973, newbie director Toby Hooper, who passed away on August 26, 2017 at the age of 74, and a group of unknown actors ventured out into Central Texas heat to make a horror movie. Braving blistering temperatures, onset injuries, and a shoestring budget, they produced one of the most terrifying motion pictures ever made. More than four decades after its release, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre still shocks and thrills audiences with its realistic imagery, unhitched tone, and based on a true story marketing. Not bad for a little film that drove the cast and crew insane during production. From marathon shooting days to flying chainsaws to mafia money problems. The inspiration for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre are surprisingly diverse, ranging from director and co-writer Toby Hooper's attempt to make a modern retelling of Hansel and Gretel to real-life Wisconsin murderer and corpse defiler Ed Gein. According to Hooper, though, the light bulb moment that really ignited the film came in a department store during a Christmas 1972 shopping rush. There were these big Christmas crowds. I was frustrated and I found myself near a display rack of chainsaws. I just kind of zoned in on it. Hooper had then told Texas Monthly, I did a rack focus on the saws and I thought, I know a way I could get through this crowd really quickly. I went home, sat down, and all the channels just tuned in. The zeitgeist blew through me. The whole damn story came to me in what seemed like 30 seconds. The hitchhiker, the old brother at the gas station, the girl escaping twice, the dinner sequence, people out in the country out of gas. Leatherface the chainsaw wielding maniac who would go down in history as one of horror cinema's greatest villains. Shows obvious Ed Gein influences thanks to his mask crafted from human skin, but Gein was not the character's only influence. The idea of a mask made of human skin actually came to Hooper far more directly. Hooper said, before I came up with the chainsaw, the story had trolls under a bridge. We changed that to the character who eventually became Leatherface. The idea actually came from a doctor I knew. I remembered that he'd once told me this story about how when he was a pre-med student, the class was studying cadavers. And he went into the morgue and skinned the cadaver and made a mask for Halloween. We decided Leatherface would have a different human skin mask to fit each of his moods. After inspiration struck, Hooper and co-writer Kim Henkel hammered out a script over several weeks and gave it the title Head Cheese, named for the scene in which the hitchhiker describes the process of how that particular pork product is made. Then it changed to the menacing working title of Leatherface. It wasn't until a week before shooting was set to begin that the eventual title arrived, suggested to Hooper and Henkel by Warren Scarron, the head of Texas Film Commission, who helped the project get financing. Though the real crimes of Ed Gein did influence Hooper and Henkel in their writing, the idea that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is itself based on a true story is something that grew out of the marketing of the film. The opening narration, which promised that the film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, certainly helped that along, as did the original poster and its promise of what happened is true. Despite this clever aura, the tale of Leatherface and his deranged family is still a work of fiction, despite continued protestations from fans even decades later. It's hard to imagine anyone but the massive Gunnar Hansen who passed away in 2015 behind the Leatherface mask in the original film now, but he was not the first person chosen in the role. When we first heard the film was being made, Hansen, then a graduate student in Austin, was told he'd be great for the role but that it was already cast. Then the original Leatherface quit. Two weeks later, Hanson recalled, the same guy calls and says, the guy who was hired as a killer is holed up drunk in a hotel and won't come out. There's a lot of bad karma surrounding this movie and I'm quitting, he said. So I called art director Bob Burns and told him I was interested. Hanson, who stood six foot four and weighed 300 pounds, won the role from Hooper on site. With no real dialogue, apart from a gibberish scene that Hooper eventually cut to drive his character and his facial expressions hidden by a mask, Hansen had to come up with other ways to express who he thought Leatherface was. When Hooper wanted the character to squeal like a pig, Hansen went out into the country and started a friend's pig. Then to capture the mental instability of the character, he went to an Austin mental hospital and studied the movements of the patients there, which he then incorporated into his performance. Despite its reputation for gruesome mutilation and gore, 
Much of the violence in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is suggested rather than directly depicted. This is because Hooper was hoping for a PG rating so that the film could reach a wider audience. Remember, there was no PG-13 at the time. And was told by the Motion Picture Association of America that he could help his cause if he limited the amount of on-screen blood. As you watch the film, notice there's probably about two ounces of blood, Hooper later joked. Alas, the film's intensity ultimately meant it earned an R rating. Still, it's probably not as gory as you remember. The film's menacing opening narration is an instant tone setter, preparing the audience for a truly horrifying experience. The voice providing that menace was actually John Larroquette, then an unknown actor who was referred to Hooper by a friend. Hooper asked Larroquette to imitate Orson Welles for his reading, and when he didn't quite get that, uh, what the actor were ultimately provided worked wonders. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was produced on a budget of $60,000 raised by Bill Parsley, a Texas Tech administrator and former member of the Texas Legislature, who fancied himself a film producer. Even in 73, that was a shoestring budget. John Carpenter's famously low budget Halloween was made for five times that amount a few years later, which meant little pay and long hours for the cast and crew. To make matters worse, the production endured a Texas summer with temperatures in excess of 100 degrees, including 115 degree heat for an unair conditioned interior shots. A single bathroom shared by more than three dozen people, costumes that could not be changed because the actors only had one set of clothes, and a constant presence of the bone and rotting meat used as props. Virtually no member of the cast went uninjured, and the heat and stench got so punishing at one point that the actors would run to the windows of the house where the dinner scene was shot to throw up and breathe a little fresh air in between takes. The dinner scene near the end of the film in which Sally, played by Marilyn Burns, is terrorized by Leatherface and his family is one of the most intense sequences in all of horror cinema. It feels like you're actually watching a group of people going insane. In addition to the excessive heat and odor in the dining room during filming, the sequence was given another challenge. It had to be completed in a single day because John Dugan, the actor who played Grandpa, refused to endure the 10-hour process of getting his makeup applied a second time. He announced that he was not sitting through it again, Hooper had said. As a result, the cast and crew worked for 27 straight hours to finish a scene that wound up a few minutes of the film's runtime. For the role of Franklin, Sally's wheelchair-bound brother, who draws the ire of the audience when he grows angry with his more able-bodied friends, simply because he can't share in their fun, actor Paul Partain opted to take a very method approach to his work. I was young, an inexperienced actor who didn't realize that it wasn't like theater, Partain later said. You didn't have to stay in character all the time. When I first read the part, I could see that nobody wanted this guy to be there. It just hit me. He was whiny. Partain's commitment worked just as well behind the camera as it did in front of it. At one point, he and Burns stopped speaking to each other between takes, and Hanson later recalled that Franklin was the only character he was actually happy to kill. As a large man had to work every day in triple-digit heat while wearing a wool costume that he couldn't change out of, Gunnar Hanson already had it rough while making the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He got so smelly by the end of production and the rest of the cast and crew avoided eating around him. To make matters a little more difficult though, he also dealt with an interesting character technique that his victims engaged in. During the shoot, Burns and the other kids who would eventually fall prey to Leatherface avoided Hanson because they didn't want to hang out with their killer. During the filming, None of them would talk to me or sit anywhere near me and, until they were dead. This behind the scenes observance actually produced some intense on screen results. For example, when Jerry, played by Alan Danzinger, discovers Leatherface's slaughter room and meets the man himself, the scream he lets out is genuine. It was apparently the first time he had seen Hanson in full costume. Though this name would suggest a singular horrifying visage, Leatherface actually wears multiple masks in the film, the rationale being that they were the only way he could truly express himself. There's the plain killing mask that he wears for most of the film, the grandma mask he wears while preparing dinner to show his domestic side, and the makeup covered mask he wears to sit down to dinner, complete with a suit and the southern tradition of dressing up for the evening meal. The scene in which Sally's finger is cut so that her blood can be fed to grandpa was supposed to rely on a very simple special effect. The knife blade used in the scene was dulled by a piece of tape, 
which also held a rubber tube attached to a bulb full of fake blood concealed in Hansen's palm. As he dragged a knife across Burns' finger, Hansen was supposed to squeeze the bulb and pump the blood out to simulate the cut, but the tube kept clogging in take after take. Frustrated and exhausted, this was during the 27-hour shooting marathon, Hansen ultimately stripped the tape off the knife when nobody's looking and cut Burns for real. At this point, I was so crazy that I just wanted to get the film over with, he later said. Though its teeth were removed for some shots, the saw Hansen wielded in the film was indeed a working chainsaw, and it sometimes put cast members in real danger. The blade of the saw was just inches from actor William Vale's head for the scene in which Leatherface begins carving up Kirk's body, and Hooper and Pearl had to carefully dance around Hansen to shoot the film's final scenes. As Leatherface swings the saw around, Hansen himself ended up with the closest near miss of the film though. During the chase scene in which Leatherface pursues Sally through the woods at night, Hansen slipped and fell, sending the saw flying into the darkness with no idea where the deadly power tool would land. Hansen just covered his head and hoped for the best. The saw landed just a few inches away. Because of its low budget, many of the stars of Chainsaw took ownership shares in the film rather than a salary. But their shares were actually percentages of Vortex, the company set up by Henkel and Hooper to produce the film. Since Vortex only owned half the film, with Parsley owning the other half, their shares were all sliced in half, which many of them apparently didn't realize at the time. To make matters more complicated, Brian Sin Distributors, which acquired the film for its release in late 1974, was declaring revenue for the film was much, much lower than the millions it had in to, raked in at the drive-ins and midnight shows. The producers eventually told Brian Sin to court but by then the distributor's financial situation was so dire that they had no demonstrable assets to sue for. In the end, the cast saw very little money for their work. Three months, no check, Ed Neal, who played a hitchhiker later called. Six months, no check. Nine months, a check for $28.45. We were angry. In terms of ticket sales, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of the most profitable films of all time. With the addition of an extra investment to help him finish post-production, Hooper had made the film for a little more than $80,000 and Bryanson acquired it for distribution for $225,000. The film went on to earn $12 million at the box office in its first year, according to Variety, but Bryanson ultimately claimed only about a million dollars of that. Why the discrepancy? Allegedly because Bryanson's owners, Joe and Lou Perino, were members of the Colombian crime family. The brothers apparently got into the film business in the first place after muscling away the rights to another classic. 70s cult film Deep Throat. Because of its realism and true story marketing, Texas Chainsaw created the opportunity for some interesting encounters between fans and cast members. McMinn once recalled picking up a hitchhiker with a friend, which is ironic given the film's relationship to hitchhikers, and listening to him describe how scary the film was to her until she asked if he recognized her. I thought he was going to have a coronary, she said. Of all the cast members, it was Ed Neal, the hitchhiker himself, who would have the most amusing reaction from fans. He used to visit screenings of the film at Austin's Village Theater, wait for his scenes to come up, and then tap viewers on the shoulder and watch them freak out. They finally asked me not to come back anymore, Neal said. The original location used in the house of Leatherface and his family was located in Williamson County, Texas, in what is now the Round Rock area. The house isn't there anymore, but if you head west on Austin into Kingsland, you can find the actual home restored and now in use as a restaurant. It's called the Grand Central Cafe, and though the owners proudly include cinematic heritage in his website, you won't find any human bones as part of the decor. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre influenced generations of filmmakers. Alexandra Adra and Gregory Levasseur has been extremely vocal about how this film influenced their careers. Ridley Scott calls it one of only a few really, really great movies. The list goes on and on. So that wraps this one up. I want to hear from you. Post your thoughts on this video and let me know how this film impacted your love for horror. That's it for this episode. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you share this video. Make sure you subscribe. But most of all, make sure you keep it horror. <laughs>